Hello, and welcome to the Satellite Image Deep Learning Podcast. I'm Robin Cole, and it's my pleasure to present another technically focused episode in the series. In this episode, I catch up with Konstanty Klemmer to discuss SatClip, which is a new global and general purpose location encoder trained on Sentinel-2 imagery. Our conversation covered the training of encoders such as Clip and discussed the implications for downstream applications. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, Constantine. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks what for having you... me. Fantastic. Why don't you get the ball rolling and tell us where you work and what you do? Right. So my name is Constantine Klemmer. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Microsoft Research New England in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, yeah, I have a PhD in computer science. I have a master's in civil engineering. I have an undergrad in economics. And throughout my research career, I've been quite an interdisciplinary researcher. Mm -hmm. um, but what I, all kind of my, my my academic journey has in common is that I've always been very excited about geospatial data. Right. Um, that starting with kind of more business analytics um, focused on on. Um, problems like car sharing and bike sharing which mm -hmm. originally got me into this in my undergrad um then uh proceeded with that kind of line of work during my masters and in my pc i moved more and more into into machine learning mm -hmm. specifically for geospatial data and that that's what i do now and yeah recently i've been very excited about um i guess what is colloquially referred to as foundation models, so large neural network models that are trained on on big data, uh, big data without labels, right? So, uh, which which is something we have a lot in the geospace. If you think about the kind of vast amounts of satellite imagery, for example, that exists, usually they're not labeled, right? It's just a satellite image. There's no kind of further information we have. Like, yeah. I don't know, is there a is there a power plant on this image? We don't necessarily have that information. Often that requires kind of uh, careful hand labeling, mm -hmm. but there's still a lot we can learn from the unlabeled data. And this right. is what I'm excited about currently. Oh, curiously, was the fact that there's lots of unlabeled data part of the attraction for geospatial or did you? No, not originally. Originally, um, and I would say even now, my main motivation are impactful applications. Yeah. So I come from the more urban space, originally focused very much on urban mobility and transportation. Uh, which motivated me to get into this field. Mm -hmm. um, I've kind of expanded my um, application focus a little bit. So I'm also working on a lot of climate related problems now. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I strongly believe that there's so much opportunity for deploying machine learning specifically for geospatial data that can help us tackle really like grand human challenges from from climate change to yeah. the kind of increasing urban densification that we see and yeah i believe it can really help people yeah i totally agree with that talking of foundational models that brings us on to the topic of this this conversation sat clip this is a paper that you've been involved in do you mind giving us a bit of an introduction to sat clip yeah, for sure. Um, first, let me shout out my amazing co-authors. So this paper is uh, written together with uh, Mark Roswurm, who's an assistant professor at Wageningen University, Esther Rolf, who's a postdoc uh, here in, in Boston at Harvard, and then two of my Microsoft colleagues, uh, Lester Mackey, who's also with me in the New England lab, and Caleb Robinson, who is at the Air for Good lab in, in Redmond. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so yeah, the let me start to explain the paper by talking about a different paper that kind of very much motivated this and that is the original clip paper so sat clip already has clip in the title um and clip is a paper that was written by openai and it's not something that necessarily people in the general public have heard about even though they've probably used it so let me explain that quickly um what clip does is basically trying to translate in neural network space, in neural network terms between image and text modalities. Mm -hmm. So think about a large data set of images with corresponding text, right? So you might have an image of a, I don't know, a, a shepherd dog, and then the text description says, this is a German shepherd on a in a green meadow, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have like a very large data set, hundreds of thousands of images with corresponding texts. And um, the idea of clip is 
to train a neural network to learn a kind of a joint embedding that allows uh, neural network models to translate from one modality to another. And right. the way this is achieved in neural network terms, again, is to feed your image through an image encoder. So go from the image space, so width, height, and then three RGB channels to some embedding space, let's say 512 characters, mm -hmm. and do the same for the corresponding text, right? So go from the text sequence or the token space to the same 512 length embedding space. Mm -hmm. Now you have image embeddings and text embeddings, and you have a large batch, let's say 1,000 1, images and 1,000 texts. What you then do is you randomly kind of shuffle those around. So you have randomly shuffled images and randomly shuffled text embeddings. And then the learning objective for the neural network is to match the correct image with the correct text embedding. Mm -hmm. If you do this for a long time and with lots of data, you will learn to align the embedding space, right? So you'll learn to align um, the image embedding with kind of the corresponding text. Mm -hmm. And... Um, in and of itself, this is not like super intuitive and not like super applicable to 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 a downstream task. But and now I come to where people have actually interacted with this. Mm -hmm. OpenAI has used this clip uh, model as a pre-training step, and um, then have used kind of the learned embeddings from clip to train uh, image diffusion models. And we are all familiar with those because these are the, the DALI family of models, right? So DALI right. 2, for example, um, is powered in, in large parts by these uh, by this clip pre-training and by these clip embeddings. Um, and that, that makes perfect sense, right? Because uh, what what uh, DALI does is exactly the same. You, you, you enter a text prompt and it translates that into a uh, synthesized image. Mm -hmm. Okay, so far for clip. Now, what is set clip? Uh, it's set clip. We kind of change. We we have the same idea, but we change two things. First, we go from natural RGB images to a satellite images. So these are multispectral, thirteen channel Sentinel one satellite images. Uh, sorry, Sentinel two, mm -hmm. which is one of the ESA missions, European Space Agency. And uh, we also don't have corresponding texts to go with these images. We have corresponding locations, right? So these are just simply the latitude longitude coordinates of the image centroid mm -hmm. on the on the on the globe on the sphere of our planet um but then we try to do the same thing we embed the images in an image embedding we embed the locations in a location embedding and we try to to match um the correct image uh, with the correct uh, location embedding now the idea here again is to translate between this kind of location and image space and um I think an intuition for how how the models go about this is um, is kind of twofold. First, for the um, image embedding, the image embedding will try to capture features within the image that make it very unique to a specific location. Mm -hmm. And you can think about this. Uh, maybe some people in this podcast will actually have played that game uh, as as the game GeoGuessr, which is a uh, yeah, it's like a, a online game um, that basically randomly drops you in a street view scene, uh, scene on a Google Street View. And um, you will then have to kind of identify or, or guess where on the on the earth you are. Right. Which location. So you could be in Paris and you'd say, oh, I see the yes. Eiffel Tower. That would be exactly. easy. Exactly. Yeah. That would be very easy. Um, or you see like a street sign in a specific language and you're like, oh yeah, this is, this is I don't know, um, Japanese letters. I'm probably in Japan. Yeah. Um, so the image encoder will kind of try to identify features that are unique to a given location. Um, and now think about this the other way around um, from a location's perspective. If you're given like a specific location um, on the map of the world, let's say like just a pin that is dropped, let's say in, in Saharan Africa, your immediate intuition for what you would expect at this location would probably be something like a desert. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, if you uh, see a location in Greenland, you'll probably expect glaciers, mountains. So we 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 all have this kind of intuition in our mind, and so we're trying to do the same uh, with a neural network model. We try to teach a neural network model for a given location what kind of image or image features would you expect there, and for a given image, where which kind of location would you expect this image to come from? Right. So you need a that very large intuition. data set covering pretty much the entire landmass, do you? Yes. And so that is, yeah, so that gets us to the kind of data set creation. And this is exactly right. 
um, the success of SatClip and doing this kind of pre-training very much depends on the design of the data set. And we sample 100,000 uh, image scenes from Sentinel-2, uh, approximately uniformly randomly distributed uh, over landmass of, of planet Earth. So this includes all continents, um, all landmass. Um, also, we have this kind of restriction that there should be no cloud coverage because we use Sentinel-2, so that can see through clouds, unlike radar, um, which can be a bit tricky in, like, for example, tropical areas where there's lots of cloud coverage. So um, kind of finding, finding cloud-free imagery there is a bit harder. But overall, I think we succeed with our training data set, and it's, it, it looks quite nicely distributed right. over the map. And are these single season images, or do you have to sample across seasons so it understands, well, yeah, this so is a that, tropical forest, or this is a temperate forest? That's a great question. So right now, the kind of location encoder we use really just takes in latitude, longitude coordinates. We don't use the time information that we would also have for our satellite image. Mm -hmm. We don't use that at all. What we do, though, is we sample these uh, sentinel scenes over two years. So all seasonalities across the globe are technically included in our, um, you know, data set. And um, you can think about this in, in the way, uh, in the following way, think about the kind of Rocky Mountain range in, in North America. If you have, um, it's a quite big range, so we will have several uh, observations that kind of capture this area. Now, the same observation has approximately the same likelihood to be have been captured in July versus uh, December, which will look vastly different on a satellite image because in July we might have much less snow coverage or no snow coverage, whereas in December we will most certainly have that. Mm -hmm. And so the current form of set clip can be seen as kind of averaging over seasons. Yeah. And that obviously requires a particularly large data set for the averaging to work out across four different seasons then? Yes, uh, again, it's it's 100,000 scenes across the globe. I wouldn't call it a massive data set yet. Um, and I would call SETCLIP a prototype more than anything. I think it's mm -hmm. a very useful prototype as we show in the kind of experiments we do in our paper. But still, I think there's, there's clearly benefits from just making that data set much bigger and integrating the timestamp directly into the model. Yeah. And just a question on the data set you chose Sentinel-2 because of the wide coverage and the, the ease of access, I suppose. Yes. Yeah, so there, there's two reasons we chose Sentinel-2. First, it is globally available for any location on the planet. And again, with this kind of caveat of cloud coverage, it's also equal quality everywhere. Mm -hmm. So that is reason one. And then reason, reason two is a bit more, um, I guess, up for discussion. Um, and like almost a philosophical question. And that is the question, uh, what describes a location best, right? What kind of data would anyone use to best describe a given location? Um, and we believe that Sentinel-2 satellite imagery or satellite imagery in general is a very good descriptor of a location, right? Because you'll be able to see the kind of ecological factors at a location. Is there lots of vegetation? Does it look like a hot area, right? Or does it look like a very dry or a very wet area? Um, so these kind of more natural uh, features. But then also satellite imagery will tell us something about human-built infrastructure, right? So we'll be able to see, for example, roads or, or, or built environment. We'll see if this is farmland or not. And we might even be able to tell something about socioeconomic factors, right? Is this a kind of poor area, right? Do we see uh, like concrete structures or do we see like wood structures mm -hmm. even even some cultural features might be recognizable like uh, yeah landmarks uh, churches for example um but i think this question like what is the best uh, data to describe a location is very much up in the air and it's also not uh the case that you have to choose one data set, right? Um, I think future iterations of these kind of models will most certainly be multi-model and combine different uh, data sources. Right. Fascinating. So once you've trained the model, uh, you then can create these basically representations of any location on Earth. You just input a lat and long, is that right? That's right. So the location encoder of the pre-trained uh, Sacklip model takes in raw lat long coordinates on the whole planet and it will return a 
embedding that is 265 characters long in our case that um, will describe that location. Now, I say we can generate that for the whole planet, which is true, but it's not necessarily meaningful for the whole planet. Mm -hmm. um, and it is especially not meaningful for the oceans. We don't have any satellite imagery over oceans. We, we only focus on landmass. Also, it would be very hard to tell apart, uh, to, like to localize to satellite images of an ocean. It's mm -hmm. not very information rich. Um, and so the we, we while we can generate embeddings over oceans, these are meaningless. They're basically yeah. just uh, default back to the kind of random initialization of the neural network. Out of curiosity, have you tried visualizing these embeddings to see if they correlate? Yes, with, um, of... especially in our the appendix of our paper. Let me quickly look uh, which figure in the appendix it is. Um, but we have a figure uh, like that in the appendix of our paper. And I think it also shows kind of both the meaningful embeddings over um, over landmass and the embeddings that are uh, over oceans. Okay. Fantastic. So yeah, it's got this, eight this tool, in the appendix. essentially, given any geospatial data set with lat long as one of mm -hmm. its features, we can then add these embeddings uh, as additional features and then yeah. train for downstream tasks. Is that right? Yeah, that is right. Um, so the, the idea here is the following. The embeddings can basically replace image features. That is our intuition. Now, if you already have a downstream task, like let's say, I don't know, population density estimation from satellite imagery. If you already have the satellite images um, or already have like a pre-trained model that can analyze them, uh, satellite embeddings will most likely not be better. However, in cases where you're resource constrained, you, you don't have the capacity to download uh, large chunks of satellite data or to you know, train these very intense vision transformers or, or CNN models that will then extract features from these raw satellite images. In these kind of resource uh, sparse environments, SACLIP embeddings are particularly useful. And um, this kind of line of work is uh, already exists, and um, I want to sh also shout out here work uh, of my co-author Esther, who has kind of worked on this in the past, and they've developed the the mosaics um, model, which tries to do something similar. They basically um, also extract uh, features from satellite images without you actually having to to download any satellite imagery. Right. And at a high level, what's the sort of main difference between SACLIP and Mosaics? And All right. So um, Mosaics, I think, at least in my intuition, can be best seen as a as a database. Um, so uh, the, the kind of input is the same. You only put in a latitude-longitude coordinate, and you uh, will give in return, I think, feature vector of length 4,000 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, what uh, Mosaics does is... For any given input location, it looks up the nearest available satellite image, and then it extracts random convolutional features. So these are random features from an untrained CNN. So there's no kind of pre-training happening, which is uh, one of the key differences to SATLIP. No. And uh, as I said, the embedding, uh, Mosaic's embedding is, uh, I think, 4,000 characters long, at least the ones we used. And so it's kind of much bigger than SATLIP embeddings. Okay. And do you think there's any sort of compromise there? If you have a smaller embedding that you have less rich information in it, or it's not really? So there is, I don't think there's a compromise in, or like we didn't like um, uh, investigate that much for the um, the kind of different size of the embeddings, but there is a, a key difference between mosaics and, um, and set clip. And then that is, um, Satlib is basically, since it's trained on, on 100,000 images, if their location that is plugged into a pre-trained Satlib location encoder is not one that is available in the in the training set, which you know obviously most locations aren't if we only choose 100,000, the Satlib basically returns location embeddings that are interpolations of the image features of the nearest locations available. Now, Mosaics doesn't do any interpolation, right? It basically just queries the nearest available image and returns yeah. features for that. And so Mosaics will be able to provide much more fine-grained features and it will not do any kind of smoothing. Uh, Setclip, it does interpolate over space. And so the 
you, we can also see that in the visualizations in our paper, kind of creates a somewhat smooth surface. Mm -hmm. Whereas mosaics are very, very um, fine grained features that are very different for a given location. And so what that means for applications is that if your applications are on a more um, larger global scale, what we find in our paper is that we outperform mosaics quite handsomely. Um, if the kind of task is much more restricted to like a specific area, it might look differently and mosaics might be might be the better choice. And presumably you could also combine them both. Yes. So we did try that a little bit. We didn't go super much into detail because our first experiments just showed that this didn't work at all. But um, yeah, so table five in the appendix of a paper does kind of a little investigation where we combine different embeddings that exist and and yeah. see if they together improve performance, which we which we don't find. But then okay. again, we didn't investigate this very thoroughly. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Um, and what's the future then? I mean, you've, you've you've described two different approaches to creating embeddings: pre-training, not pre-training. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Sentinel Sentinel two at the moment. What's the yeah. future then? Different modalities different techniques do you think yeah so the the future is i think wide open which makes us <clears throat> i think a very exciting research field um so first of all i think the the way we do these kind of location encoders um, can be adapted, right? So I, I just said that we just use latitude, longitude as inputs. I think very intuitively, the next step would be to also include the timestamp. Um, so you can kind of query a, a location embedding at a given location endpoint in time. Yeah. This is, I think, the next uh, clearest step, but also kind of changing the architectures of the location encoders, making them bigger, uh, allowing them to basically integrate more location knowledge is is kind of these are clear next steps and, and then like you mentioned the training data is a the the other i think big open question we use sentinel 2 we think it's 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 great but uh, i think multimodal is also the way to go here and um if you look at kind of the emerging foundation models in the in the geospace, we see more and more uh, multi-model uh, models. So I think the Clay Foundation model that was launched only a few weeks ago is a great example. Um, and they stack Sentinel-2, Sentinel-1, and the digital elevation model all together in like one data cube. Right. Something like that, I think, is a very, very clear next step. Well, very exciting time, lots of potential, uh, even just... For the applications that then don't need to access imagery but can just query a model that's really exciting yes I think step change in uh, functionality yes um final i'm just curious how this model fits into the context of what the lab is doing in general and and also microsoft right so um i'm i'm a postdoc at microsoft which means i have like ultimate research flexibility and independence so this does not necessarily fit in super well within my lab though i will say uh there is uh one of my co-authors Lester Mackey at msr new england is very much looking in in different uh earth science uh projects as well so he's, he's a project on subseasonal forecasting that um, is is somewhat related to this. I think also the kind of interesting statistical properties of geospatial data are something that uh, is very interesting to the kind of more statistical machine learning side of Microsoft. Um, yeah, I guess the keyword here is just the kind of autocorrelation that is mm -hmm. very apparent in all sorts of geospatial data and how to best use that uh, in, in, in neural network models. And the kind of the clip objective that we use very much makes use of that, right? So the intuition is, you know, nearby satellite images will look quite similar, whereas far away ones will look very different. Yeah. Yeah. And um, but then I will say I think this the this is the the sat clip work is very much uh, of interest to other parts of the organization, and I think especially also to the machine learning, uh, sorry, AI for Good Lab in in Redmond, where Caleb Robinson is from. They are doing a lot of work on remote sensing and geospatial machine learning, and this just falls right in there. Fantastic, and of course the papers on archive, the code is on GitHub, so check them out if people want to follow along uh, the updates. Uh, LinkedIn, is that the right place for people to follow yeah, you? Yeah, LinkedIn or, or Twitter or X, so it's now called, I think, uh, places mm -hmm. where Zitter. I will 
post updates yeah <laughs> and my website i have a website too okay fantastic well once again thanks for joining me today fascinating conversation i look forward to hearing future updates thank you so much uh, thanks for having me and hope people enjoy this